Our scripture today comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. May the Lord send a blessing, and may we be formed and shaped into the people of God at the reading of God's word. Peter writes, As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also... You also, like living stones, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you... But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray together. Hmm. Lord, where your spirit is, there is freedom. So I ask that your spirit might blow through our hearts, through our church, that we might be set free to fully be the people of God. Lord, I believe that your word has the power to bring life to dead places. I believe your word has power to awaken hearts. And so I ask, Lord, that you would awaken me and breathe upon the dead places in my heart that at the preaching of your word, Christ, our cornerstone, would be magnified in our hearts. God, have your way in this church. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was a kid, way back in the day, I was a mama's boy. If mom wasn't around, I would cry. Every time, as soon as my cognitive awareness recognized mother was not around, I would cry. And my dad would say to me, stop crying, stop crying, and I would continue to cry. But I distinctly remember the very last time that I cried because my mother wasn't around. It was one Sunday afternoon following service. A group of families went to the pastor's home. I was about four years old at the time. And I got distracted, probably was playing my first generation Game Boy where the colors were green and dark green probably like Kirby's Adventures or something. And I realized my mother was not around. And also my father wasn't around, so I started to panic, started to cry. But the reason this was the last time that I cried was because when my parents returned from, I don't know, I think they went for a walk or something, uh, my dad, he came to me, and instead of saying, stop crying, He grabbed me by the shoulders, and he said to me this. He said, you are our son. You are our child. I am your father. This is your mother. Why the heck would we leave you in a stranger's home? We're not going to leave you behind. You are 
our son. And up until that time, whenever I would cry, my dad was telling me to change my behavior, change what I was doing, stop crying. But in this moment, instead of speaking a word of instruction about how I was to behave, what did he do? He spoke a word of identity. He told me who I was. And in these six verses that we just read in Peter's letter to several churches that were under persecution, he also speaks a word of identity. If you read the whole letter, you'll see he gives very specific instructions on how these churches that are being persecuted ought to relate with the state that is persecuting them. But in these verses, he doesn't just instruct them on how they are to behave. He tells them who they are because when we are tested in our faith sometimes what we need isn't just instructions on how Christians need to behave when our faith is tested what we need is a word of remembrance of who we are so Peter says, hey, I know that you guys are in a rough situation, but do you know who you are? You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. I know that you are being marginalized by the society, but you are still the people of God. It's like he's grabbing them by the shoulders and reminding them of who they are. And I believe that this morning the Spirit of God might grab us, Christ Church Sugarland, and remind us of who we are. And I just want to say, knowing our identity as a church is so vital to the health of our community because when a church forgets it's theological identity. When a church forgets who they are, then their actions, their behaviors, their gatherings, their programs, all that they do can become rooted in a rote, meaningless tradition. In other words, when a church forgets their identity, the church often just does what it does because it's what it does and it's what is done forever and ever and ever because that's just what we do, right? If we don't know who we are, we just do what we do. So my question to you this morning, Christ Church, what is your understanding of our identity? Or if you're like visiting from another church, I'd ask you, what is uh, your own local church's identity? What is your understanding of your church and its identity? Now, uh, I never have time to get through everything that I'd like to get through in a sermon. I'm very long-winded, still working on this. So I can't go through everything that uh, St. Peter is trying to say to these churches, but I want to press in on two particular phrases that he says about the church's identity. He says that we are living stones being built into a spiritual house, and then he says this phrase, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. So with those two particular phrases, I want those two phrases for us to receive them as the identity of our church this morning. Okay, are you ready? So Peter says, as you come to Jesus... Jesus is the living cornerstone, and as you come to him, you also, he's talking about you, he says, you also are like living stones, and you are together being built into this spiritual house, which literally translates as a house of the spirit or a temple. You are being built into a temple. Now, one of the things that makes the Christian faith or that made the Christian faith so radical, unique, and distinct to all the other religions of its day was that Christianity was the first religion to say, you don't need a physical temple to encounter God. 
You don't need a physical altar. You don't even need a priest or to go through any ritualistic uh, pietist actions because we believe that Jesus is the temple. That in the person, in the body, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God, the fullness of God's presence was happy to dwell. And not only is Jesus the temple, Jesus is our great high priest. Jesus is the sacrifice by which we have access to God. And this was the Christian belief. But in this text, Peter presses in on this idea of Jesus as temple. And he draws us in as he says something very interesting. He, he doesn't just say Jesus is the temple. He says, Jesus is the living cornerstone, the living foundation of the temple. And then he invites us in as he says what? That you all are like living stones. And as you are built together, As you lay on top of the foundation, the cornerstone of Jesus, you all are becoming the temple of God, the place where God's presence dwells. Stay with me. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, you guys are all temples. He doesn't say, you're a temple, you're a temple, you're a temple, you're a temple, and God's presence dwells in you, God's presence dwells in you, and you, and you. He says, you are all living stones. And together, collectively, as you build and grow together, press in on one another, you are together becoming the temple of God. So temple buildings, right? Literal buildings like this one here. How do you build a building? You build brick by brick by brick. Or I don't know what material our building is built with. You build with material upon material. But the temple of Christ, the New Testament temple, it is not built brick upon brick. The dwelling place of God for us Christians is built Christian by Christian by Christian. In other words, the community of Christ The community of Christ, the actual relationships that we have with one another is the context in which God's presence dwells. Now, here in Houston, we have a lot of large church buildings, right? There's one church on 59 where the Houston Rockets used to play. That comes to mind when I think of large church buildings. But do you know that the presence of God, the power of God, does not dwell in large or small buildings, but rather in the depth of relationships within a Christian community. So, how many closet charismatics do we have in the house today at Christ Church Sugarland? Everyone's still shy to get out the closet, okay? I'm out and in the open, all right? I rolled deep in the charismatic world for a while. Me and my friends, we were all about, like, worshiping God in this super expressive way, like, shaking, and, like, we were all about, like, everyone just got freaked out and they were about to leave the church. Uh, We wanted to experience God in this, like, tangible way. And so we would go to, like, these large conventions. We would follow, like, these, like, pseudo-famous quasi-famous worship leaders, like, oh, did you feel God's presence there? It was so awesome, right? And we would, like, we were, like, we were, like, like, addicts to God's presence, right? But I'll tell you, the most tangible presence of God that I ever felt, I don't think that sentence made any sense, uh, the most I ever felt God's presence in a tangible way was at my pastor's house in this house church that we started on a Good Friday service during our second year of existence. So we had planted this church. I was like 17 years old. We were meeting in, uh, in, in this pastor's house, and we'd worship together. And once a week, at this point for two years, or really multiple times a week, I would gather with this group, and more specifically, I'd gather with about eight other guys. And week after week after week, for two years straight, We would get together 
eat some Los Angeles burritos and tacos, and then we would read scripture together, and this was very important, we would confess our sins together and pray for one another. But at this particular Good Friday service, the pastor asked us to do something. He said, I know you guys have been confessing your sins to one another in your small groups. Before we continue in worship, I want you guys to break off to your groups, and I want to challenge you to really bring into the light those things that you have kept hidden from God and hidden even from your closest members of your small group. So we all... And we're like teenagers, so like we do weird stuff when you're a teenager. And uh, we all go to our small groups, right? And you can feel this kind of tension. Everyone's like, all right, who's going to talk first? And by the end of our conversation, at least in my group, (laughs) we're all like crying, right? Because we all like... It's so much shame of all the things that we were afraid to share with one another. But as we shared, this deep-seated fear and shame was finally released. And we felt this deep sense of connection as we prayed for one another. And then we gathered back together in the living room. (laughs) And this is mid-2000s. And after the pastor read uh, Romans 8, Uh, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We began to sing that Hillsong classic. It's funny, I'm saying it's a classic. It's mid-2000s. The song called Savior King, right? How many of you guys know about Savior King? Nobody. Okay, fantastic. (laughs) Savior King was was like the hottest song. And in the bridge, this is how the lyrics went. It said, I love you, Lord. I worship you. Hope which was lost now stands renewed. And we had sung this song many times before. But in that particular moment, as I opened my eyes and looked around this living room, I saw 50 of my friends, 10 of whom were my closest friends who had just bared their soul with me, and I saw everyone weeping as we were all singing together about the redemptive and victorious work of Christ. And it wasn't the song, it wasn't the house, the building, it was the depth of relationship that caused me to tangibly feel God's presence like never before. And if I can be honest with you, I yearn for the day when Sunday mornings we would all be able to look at one another as we're singing and we know one another's stories and we're singing over one another and we feel the song embracing us as a community. Because each time that we had gathered together during those two years and during that time when we confessed our sins to one another, we were living stones pressing on top of one another, forming the dwelling place of God's spirit. Come on, somebody. But here's the problem, okay? Here's the problem. We don't talk about church like it's a community. One's, like, think about like the common phrases that you use when you talk about church, right? Have you ever said this? Come on, kids. I've never said this, but I imagine you have. Come on, kids. We're going to be late for church. Huh. We're going to be late for church. So church is a time period. Or how about this? Have you ever said this? Um, hey, what church do you go to? Oh, my church is across the street from the middle school. Or my church is right next to the baseball field. Hmm. So church is a location, an architectural space that you step into and step out of. And this next one, and I know we all participate in this, so no guilt, right? And I I, I talk like this too, but I think this actually is really, if we think about it, 
We need to be really careful when we start to talk about church in this way. Have you ever asked the question, hey, how was church yesterday? Have you ever asked the question, what did you think about church this morning? And we talk about church as if it's some sort of commodity that exists to satisfy our preferential desires, right? And if you think about it, location, time, commodity. We often talk about church in the same way that we talk about like a restaurant on a Yelp review, right? Where it's at, what time it's open, and how it is. But when Peter talks about the church, he says this. He says, before you were a part of the church, you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And he's not just saying we're a community. He's saying we are a community that has made and received covenant with God. We are a community to whom God is committed and a community that is committed to God and to one another. Do you want a good definition for church? Can I give you the answer to the question, what is our identity as Christ Church Sugarland? We are a people who have made covenant with God and with one another. In other words, to put it succinctly, we are a covenant community. When somebody joins Christ Church, where does that take place? What happens when somebody wishes to join our community? We invite them up to the front of this altar, and we ask them to make vows that they will uphold this community with their prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And right afterwards, we ask you all, we ask you all to renew your vows. When else do you come to the altar and make vows? At your wedding day, right? So I made my wedding vows a year, year and a few months ago, and... Lisa and I, we walk to the aisle in the presence of God, in the presence of friends and family. We said that we would take one another as husband and wife until death do us part. And when I talk about my marriage, I don't talk about my marriage like it's some location, like I go to marriage. And when I talk about my marriage, I don't talk about it like it's some event, like some time period, like Friday around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I go to marriage. And if I ever talk about marriage like a commodity, I will be in big trouble, right? <laughs> because marriage, when you make a vow, you are identifying who you are. You're identifying your values and what you are living into. And so likewise, our church is not an architectural space. Our church is not this 60 to 80 minute gathering that we do, depending on how long the preacher preaches. Our church is you and me literal human beings, the community. And can I tell you something? This is good news. Because what it says is God resides not in buildings, but in us. You don't need to be in a specific time or place for God's power to break through. You already possess as the people of God everything that is necessary to be liberated from the sin that entangles us. We said, Lord, where you are, I am free. And do you know where God is? In our church community. So yesterday, I played some kickball in the morning. Okay, kickball, like baseball, with your foot and a big ball that is red or blue like you did when you were kids and you had Game Boys of the first generation. And I played kickball with maybe like 13 other human beings from our church community. Like we were all sore after the first inning, right? Because nobody exercised, except for my wife. Uh, 
And then right before we play kickball, we ate steak together, right? We should have done that in reverse order because we were all like sick while running around the field. But in that moment of just building community together, we didn't do anything super spiritual. I just like prayed a generic prayer <laughs> before we ate. But in our gathering together, in the building of actual relationships, I believe we were building stone upon stone to the dwelling place of God. And this Wednesday and every Wednesday uh, this month, we'll be gathering together to study the gospel of John together. And each time we gather, we'll be building stone upon stone upon stone, just like many of you uh, do in your own small groups and neighborhood groups. And that actually is the temple of God. Relationships here. And so if you are not a part of some sort of small cluster network of friends where you are consistently reading scripture together, sharing life together, confessing sin together, I would say, come on, man. Live into your identity. You are a living stone, and we together are to become the dwelling place of God. Amen.